Okay. So part of the um, presentation I'm giving was actually given earlier. Uh, so I mean, like this slide, for example. I prepared it for students uh, at uh, UZH in Zurich who were studying Somalia, but very much from a cultural and literary perspective. Yeah? So I just wanted to give them a different insight into the people also of Somalia. Like, and as, we, as Malavika just mentioned, we have like these kind of set images, perceptions of Somalia in the West. So I try to debunk them a little bit, yeah? Okay, but let's just start with the... Um, so here's like a small plan. I mentioned already, Somalia in the Horn of Africa geopolitics. Then the, the issue of triple amnesia of the Somali people. This is something pretty big in Africa, which is uh, the triple heritage idea. And it's been turned around here by a Somali scholar, uh, the concept of triple amnesia. Then the basic social structures in Somalia, I'll probably skip that part a little bit because that can take a bit long. Um, and then the whole question of the state building. The interesting thing of Somalia is that it offers three simultaneous examples of state building. One is the, success, the successionist state of Somaliland in uh, Northwest Somalia. That has been independent since 1991 and functions as a effective state with its own, I mean, checking just about all the boxes for effective states, but it, is it recognized? Yeah, well, like uh, so many other African states which are not effective are recognized. So then we have the federal government, which really started being built in 2004 after a conference. And then we have a third case, which is similar a little bit to what we've seen about uh, Taliban. It's this Islamic Emirate, which has been set up by al Shabaab since 2009. And then we have the whole issue of the international assistance to Somalia, you know, also humanitarian. So first of all, let's like ask, when we talk about the Horn of Africa, what do we actually mean, yeah? So usually we talk about like countries, yeah? When we speak about the Horn of Africa, and this is Somalia here, and then Somaliland, which is here, it's not, indicated on the map, uh, the small countries of Djibouti and Eritrea, and then obviously the big country of Ethiopia. And then parts of northeastern Kenya, which are mostly inhabited by Somalis in the, like, the desert areas, the arid zones, are also often taken under the Horn of Africa. And then in a very more narrow definition, even a geographic, you could cut it like from here. This is the actual horn, yeah? The, which, which appears on the map to be like a horn. And that would be actually all the Somali inhabited areas, which we have drawn like in a red line around where Somalis are major, majoritarian. So you see a fair chunk of Ethiopia also has a big Somali population. And then the wider sense that it's often used also by international agencies, they kind of include Sudan in it and often also Kenya, and sometimes even Uganda. Although, but that's a little bit because, you know, you want to have North Africa, which is Egypt to Libya, and then you have like the Sahel or Sahara, which is often starts from Chad because it's French speaking to Mauritania. And then a little bit, Sudan is kind of left in the middle, so they kind of put it in the Horn of Africa just to give it a place, but it doesn't make complete sense actually. Okay, now we're going to look at the current geopolitical issues. So this slide is going to it can take some time. So what are the geopolitical issues? First of all, we have the shipping lanes. Yeah. So what makes so we're looking at what makes the Horn of Africa important, in other words. Yeah. So you have like these shipping lanes, obviously from the Red Sea, uh, sorry, from the Suez Canal. So behind that, the whole Mediterranean area, Europe, and even Western Russia. And on the other hand, obviously, it goes to the Persian Gulf, to, the, to India, and to the Southeast Asia and the Far East. And then also from the Persian Gulf down along the African coast and around the, the Cape of Good Hope, 
uh, into the uh, Atlantic, yeah, We're going to the US, uh, to the Americas and uh, west coast of Africa. So there is like very busy shipping, and obviously we know that from the pirates, yeah, from the period of the pirates of Somalia, that like had like a lot of bounty that they could just tap into along these uh, shipping lanes. So this might be even like the geopolitical priority number one, yeah, for... Uh, and then the second one, which is related to that, is the establishment of ports. And the ports have taken on like an extra importance now with the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. So uh, they, are, they are like, obviously the ports themselves are, obviously they serve the whole hinterland, yeah? And it's not only the ports which are important, but also all the, the infrastructures which are built behind it, yeah, like by, uh, pipelines. For example, here uh, in Lamu, we have a port, actually, we have the port of Mombasa. I could have made a little anchor also here in Lamu. Lamu is in Kenya, close to the Somali uh, um, border. And from Lamu, like they're building enormous, it's built completely by China, enormous new port with a pipeline which goes through Kenya to southern uh, Sudan and which is the main intention of that pipeline is to offer to South Sudan uh, an alternative route for its oil that doesn't go through Sudan to Port Sudan here, but uh, southward to the Kenyan uh, terminal. Yeah, and there's a lot of interests behind that. And with that pipeline also come new transport routes, not a railway in this case, but uh, roads. And the ports we have here, we, you see there's a few in Somalia, this Kismayo here in the south, which uh, has already uh, a deep water port, which serves uh, mostly through smuggling, but which serves Kenya. Uh, Mogadishu, obviously, here we have a, a port in Hobyo, then Bosaso. I don't know if you see, you don't see the picture. And then here you have the port of Berbera, which is the main port of of uh, Somaliland, Djibouti itself, and in Eritrea you have the port of Assab, which now seems to be discontinued. So it's not only China which is interested. Uh, the main actor in the whole uh, port sector is uh, uh, the Emirates, or the Emirates, United Arab Emirates. So they have like um, Dubai Ports World, which I think has grown out to be the largest port operator in the world. Dubai Ports World like has, I mean, operates so many ports in the world, yeah? including, for example, in India and Kochi, in the Philippines, and uh, based on the on the success, the commercial success of the port of Jubal Ali, which is a free zone port next to Dubai, they have like started expanding uh, all throughout the region. So, for example, you'll find Emirati investments here in Berbera and also in Bosaso in Puntland. Um, the Chinese are on to Hobyo, I think. The Turks, the Turks are also big players in the whole port uh, business. The Turks are Mogadishu, Kismayo. Um, I'm just trying to remember it's who is there. Um, actually, I'm not 100% sure. Mombasa, uh, China. Lamu, also China. Uh, uh, Assab is uh, also uh, Emirati in Djibouti was given to the Emirates but then the Djiboutians broke the contract and I think they renegotiated with China also. So there's a lot of like uh, prospects of future business for example uh, we'll, uh, we'll see later but uh, there's, uh, China is also buying uh, agricultural lands in Ethiopia and in South Sudan but also Saudi Arabia is buying a lot of lands so obviously the idea is to get that food out to the destination through the ports. Then we have the question of military bases. Yeah, I, I drew a few of the main ones here. Now Djibouti itself has already six military bases. Yeah, like it's quite incredible. Like the USA, France, uh, China, uh, Russia. Now Russia has been negotiating one but didn't get it. Um, but there's a few more, just uh, as you know, uh, a few more military bases here in Djibouti. Here, uh, the port of Assab and Berbera 
uh, the, Emir the Emirates don't have a military base that was very much linked to the war in Yemen. So it's not sure now if the war of Yemen like calms down whether they will still be developing those bases. Here it's Turkey in, uh, in Mogadishu. So Turkey is like the main, the main trainer of the Somali army. And this, Turkey has like built its very biggest embassy of, that it has in the whole world is built in Mogadishu. So it kind of seems surprising why would Turkey have such an interest in the re relatively unimportant and, and not so populous country of Somalia. But they've apparently made it into a kind of a geopolitical strategy cornerstone that they have this presence in the Horn of Africa. So what you see, like what we see is like, you see a little bit of the USA and uh, old colonial powers, but we see a lot of like new powers. Yeah, those intermediate powers, yeah? Turkey, the Emirates, uh, China obviously is not um, an, an, an intermediary power. It's a great power, but, but it's not used. I mean, it didn't have so many bases outside uh, its own area. So you see a lot of new players getting involved in this area. Then we have, of course, like another geopolitical issue are the, all these ethnic conflicts. Yeah? And you see there's quite a few around there. Yeah? Like, for example, obviously you have the one in Yemen. That's not ethnic. It's, uh, it's religious or relig it's actually a political conflict between North and South, but it uh, has religious tints. Here you have the recent conflict between the um, Amaras and the Tigray Tigrayans, or the central government and the rebels of the um, TPLF. You have here, these are, this is symbol for clashes between Oromo and Amara people, which have been ongoing since 2015. Then here you also have clashes between the Oromo and the Somali people along the borders. There were very violent clashes in 2017. They haven't been really resolved, so they could flare up again, notably with the elections which are planned for uh, next May. Then you have smaller, you also have conflicts here in the, in the far west of Ethiopia, which are the lowlands the, um, uh, with people that also live in South Sudan. Then obviously you have the big Sudanese, Southern Sudanese conflict. And here in Somalia, of course, you also have the conflict, but which is not an ethnic conflict, but uh, the conflict with Al Shabaab. So, yeah, quite a few. Then obviously what's very important also, especially for Europe, are the migration flows, yeah? Now here I've drawn a few. First of all, you have like, the, I think the major migration flow from the Horn of Africa is through the Gulf. And a lot of it stays in the Gulf, yeah? A lot of it uh, is to Saudi Arabia and to Kuwait and uh, other places like that. But then also quite a few of the people get on through Gulf countries and then end up in Turkey. And, uh, and then join, let's say, the mass migration routes from Turkey into Europe. So you have here from Eritrea into, um, into Yemen. And also uh, from uh, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of migrants go through Bosasso in Puntland. And if you like w uh, drive around Somaliland here on these roads where I'm showing, you often find, and you know, it's really dry, harsh climate, but you often find people walking, you see from their clothes and their looks at the Ethiopians, and they've walked all the way from the highlands here, they're mostly Oromo, and they walk all the way here throughout and then arrive at Bosasso, and then often stay here for a few months trying to somehow get some money to make the crossing into Yemen. Uh, you know, they're, they're really, it's a really hard route also. You don't have the horror of Libya, uh, but it's also, I mean, you have a lot of other big problems. Huh? And then you also have obviously still the migration into Kenya, Nairobi being like the main business center and economic center of East Africa. So attracting a lot of migrants, mostly from Somalia, but also from South Sudan and the, uh, and then also, obviously, this is the, these are the migrant flows that go towards Europe through Libya, yeah? from Eritrea to Sudan, from Ethiopia to Sudan, and then on through this area, usually. Here you have the Libyan border. And also migrants, uh, Ethiopia is this, the second country in Africa in terms of refugees that are 
uh, from other countries in Ethiopia, yeah, and mostly they're from South Sudan, from Somalia, and also from Eritrea. So they have like a large, and many of these many of these refugees have been there for for uh, for decades already. Then obviously you have this counterterrorism interest. Uh, here you have, but right now, like the 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 main, or the, actually maybe the only, well, let's say the, the main counterterrorist uh, terrorist actors are Al Shabab, and here I've drawn roughly a line around their area of operation. I mean, I would, they they don't operate much in Ethiopia because it's a police state, but they can move through it freely. But they obviously operate in in eastern uh, Kenya and also in this whole part, south central Somalia not in Puntland or Somaliland. And then, yes, usual as usual, <laughs> geopolitical conflict, you always have some oil and gas in there. So the oil fields that have been found are mostly here, and in the, um, it is the disputed uh, zone, economic extension zone between Somalia and Kenya. Kenya says that the uh, border should go like this and Somalia says it should go like that. So the oil fields which are in the middle are the, are the um, object of a case now at the International Court of Justice in The Hague. And they have uh, created a lot of conflict. They, they, they cause a lot of tension between the current Somali government and Kenya. Then you also have uh, oil finds in the Ogaden in the Ethiopian region of the Ogaden. And then also, uh, although it's a little bit more prospective, but they seem quite surely to also be uh, oil fields in Somaliland. So wherever this, uh, the prospect of oil already, the, you have conflict, yeah? that's quite amazing. Yeah? Even before the first drop starts falling, you already have like enormous conflict. So in Ethiopian Ogaden, there's not too much conflict because the, um, the Ethiopian government has, has the new Ethiopian government has more or less agreed with the uh, Somali regional administration in the Ogaden that they can keep part of the oil profits. In Somaliland, you have the oil exploration. Uh, they started doing it on the ground already in 2000, like in the early 2010s. But each, each uh, mission, exploratory mission got aborted because of what we could call hostile natives. <laughs> uh, the Somali population doesn't have any desire to have its, uh, its, its, its ground churned up by oil companies. And the main reason is that they feel that they probably will not get anything from it and that they will just suffer the, the negative consequences while all the money flows into the government coffers. The organizations exploring oil are, there have been a lot of Norwegian oil companies, strangely enough, because the Norwegians generally, they don't get too much involved in these kind of conflictual situations, but they have been in, uh, in Somali, along the Somali coast here. So I put one oil thing here, but all along the Somali coast, halfway, uh, the, there have been oil blocks have been auctioned off now for exploration purposes, because there's a, uh, serious belief that there will be oil found. And other oil companies involved, well, it's the, it's not so much the really big ones. Yeah? The really big ones, they maybe tend to like BP and Shell, etc. They tend to stay out of it. But often you have like smaller companies, for example, from Australia or China or, um, or the Emirates. And they start doing the, they, 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 they start up the operation and when it's successful, then they can sell to one of the big majors. Then still we have fishing resources. So the um, Somali piracy started as a reaction to overfishing. I mean, it wasn't the only reason, yeah, but it was one of the main reasons and one of the main uh, legitimations for piracy was that the, um, the waters around Somalia, they were being used uh, not only as to dump nuclear waste, which has been always denied, but which is uh, which has been abundantly documented already. So a lot of nuclear waste was dumped by, uh, for example, the Swiss company Trafigura, 
it, uh, it used to like dump, uh, it used to buy nuclear waste and then just dump it off the coast in Somalia. You can even see on satellite photos, you see like yellow glowing places in the sea, yeah, which are like so radioactive. And then the other, uh, and then obviously you have this uh, fishing, yeah, especially this deep sea trawling where they just like put a net and they grab everything which is on the sea ground. Yeah? So for example, lobster and uh, many other kind of those um, shellfish are almost extinct now already in Somalia. And the main, like in the fishing business, it's obviously okay, I have countries from the whole world which are involved. Yeah? So it's really a lot of Iranian, Omani, Thai, <laughs> Filipino, Chinese, um, well, you know, from, from really from all over the world, yeah. And then you have indeed the agro resources, yeah. So, like here where I put the tractor, these are the main places where land is being bought. So in let's say central and western Ethiopia, and also in South Sudan. In South Sudan, it's a really interesting case of like. Um, of the completely destabilizing effect of uh, transition from subsistence agriculture to modern commercial uh, agriculture, yeah, with support obviously of the EU, the World Bank, and uh, and uh, other and the Asian Development Bank. But we won't get into it now. Uh, and alliance building. Now that's another kind of geopolitical game, which is really interesting. For example, now here I've put like one alliance to Black Rings, which uh, brings together Ethiopia, Eritrea, the federal government of Somalia, and uh, Gulf countries, mostly the UAE, but also a bit Saudi Arabia. For example, the UAE has been helping Ethiopia against the Tigrayan rebels by, it has set up a drone, uh, military drone camp in Eritrea, and it's flying uh, drones for the Ethiopian army, like steered by the uh, by Emiratis or by, by people working for the Emiratis, usually mercenaries. Uh, and so they're helping them to hunt out like the Tigrayan rebels and at the same time testing out the technology. Uh, so that's one. And then you have like an opposite, your, what I put like as the white rings, which is uh, Kenya because Kenya and Somalia are really at loggerheads. Kenya and Ethiopia have never had very good relations. So Kenya is, 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 is linking up with the rival of Somalia, Somaliland. And they have like exchanged uh, diplomatic niceties. And the day after the Somaliland president arrived in Kenya in December last year, the Somali government uh, broke, uh, recalled its ambassador to uh, Kenya and broke uh, diplomatic relations with Kenya. Until now, it's still broken. And who's behind that? Because who is always interested in keeping Ethiopia small? It's Egypt, yeah? So again, Egypt uh, very much out of convenience because obviously Egypt and Emirates are usually aligned on just about everything. But in this case, they back different players. Yeah? And the Emirates are a little bit up in, in the middle because they don't have like bad relations with uh, Somaliland, for example, or with Kenya. It's just that they have been supporting more the Ethiopian Eritrean and federal government side. Any questions so far? Okay, just since I'm on this anyways, like um, the Somali economy, because I'm not going to talk about it afterwards, it's also very much based on uh, the export of livestock. So the big thing that, Ethi that Somalia has specialized in since the end of the 19th century is exporting it's uh, livestock and mainly camels, sheep and goats. So they're not the meats that we eat most usually in the West, but they are eaten in large quantities, obviously in the Arabian Peninsula. And it's almost all exported uh, on foot, so alive, yeah? Because the whole idea is to, that, that the major crunches of the Eid festivals in, in, uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the Arabian Peninsula, especially of course, Eid after the Hajj, when they need to have like millions and millions of sheep to slaughter for the pilgrims. So all those come mostly from Somalia. 
So they don't get much value added on the export. Huh? Even the fattening pens and the export and is usually happens by, um, by Saudi or Emirati companies. And they have like, and, and, and especially like, because they use a lot from Somaliland, but since Somaliland is not an officially recognized country, they, uh, they have like several times stopped all the export of uh, livestock to Saudi Arabia on the pretense of, uh, of possible diseases, which might be true, but it seems that like there was always like a very strong political reason also behind it. So you see, let's say what you can see is like uh, for Somalia is like that the, the, the Arabian Peninsula, Ethiopia, Kenya, and a bit further away, Turkey, Egypt, are all like really strong regional powers, yeah, which, which influence their country a lot. So it's a whole different set of players. Like in Afghanistan, we have like more, uh, we also have regional players, but we also have the big international players. In, in Somalia, it's much less. Okay, so still saying on the map, just like uh, something that explains, let's say, the cultural diversity and the difference also in political systems in this area, in the Horn of Africa, is this, uh, first of all, here, what you see here, you see this on the map, yeah? You see from Djibouti, you see lakes here, and then you see this kind of rift in Ethiopia with lakes in it. And goes down like this and then also this lake and then it goes down here uh next close to nairobi that's the great rift valley yeah the great rift valley is created by a geological phenomenon uh so this whole the whole horn of africa is basically splitting slowly from the from the rest of africa and here at this point you have also like the, the red sea plate so anyways it's like you have this um this kind of cultural divide and it's in this rift valley that the oldest remains of the homo sapiens have been found or is it homo sapiens no i think it isn't actually um just uh, in most uh, the oldest hominids yeah uh, a person called lucy <laughs> but from two million years ago so uh, so this is something obviously that the local people also take some pride in yeah you know we're the crucible of mankind so you have two kind of big cultural areas here. You have the Semitic highlands. I've just put two of the main population groups, Amhara and the Tigrinya. I say Semitic because uh, the, the languages they speak are related to Arab and Hebrew, so they're Semitic languages. The ancient, uh, uh, it seems that Arabian and Amharic have the same origin. Yeah? Amharic, by the way, it's the main language spoken in Ethiopia. Yeah? There's no Ethiopian language, but the main uh, language accepted as like uh, the, um, the vehicular language, the language that everybody speaks or should speak, the language of the government is Amhara or Amharic. Amhara is the name of the tribe. So the, Am uh, the, Amharic, uh, the Amhara and the Tigrinyas are Orthodox Christians and they, they're from a very ancient rite. So they were like, they were Christian. It seems to be, have been the first or the second Christian kingdom yeah, with Armenia in the world. And then you have the lowlands around it, which are uh, populated by Afar here, the Somalis, the, uh, the Borama, but the main grouping, the Somalis, yeah? So you have like a, a, a difference in, in geography. You have a difference also in language, the Cushitic language group. It's only spoken here in the Horn of Africa. It's a very separate language group from any other language group. So it's not, it doesn't relate to, they say now that it might relate to the Berber spoken in Northern Africa and the Amazigh spoken by the Tuaregs, but uh, that's not really clear yet. It also seems, seems to be related to ancient Egyptian. And then you have the Oromo, which actually are Cushitic speakers. Oh yeah, sorry, in the, in the lowlands, everybody's Muslim, yeah? So, uh, and then in between you have the Oromo who used to live in the lowlands and they've been gradually invading since the 16th century. They've been gradually moving into the highlands, uh, uh, pushing the Amhara in, fr uh, in front of them. 
and this kind of perception of uh, even though it's already 500 years old but it's still growing the Oromo population is growing faster than the other population so they're so they're little by little they're kind of um, even for example the capital of Ethiopia Addis Ababa although it's supposed to be an Amhara capital but actually by now it's uh, almost uh, the, like the, the the largest population is Oromo so they have also and that also has been part of the fight between the Amhara and the Oromo is that the Oromo say this is our capital yeah and we should claim it yeah but but and the Amhara say come on guys you've been invading us you this didn't used to be your land yeah? so we have these kind of discussions and the Oromo are uh, partially uh, Christian and partially Muslim. So, like also, the economy is different. Obviously, the highland populations live from sedentary agriculture, rainfall agriculture, because the Ethiopian highlands catch a lot of rain. And in the current kind of climate change, although mo most of Africa is becoming much drier, but it seems that the Ethiopian highlands, according to the forecasts, are going to get more and more rain. And as like any agricultural sedentary society, they have a much longer experience of statehood. Yeah? And uh, with the statehood also comes this organized religion yeah? and the religion of the, of the church, yeah? the Ethiopian church and its popes. Well, in the, in the arid lowlands, the, there's no possibility or hardly for sedentary agriculture. So there we have pastoralists and the pastoralists or the nomads from, from ancient times. Uh, they obviously do not have a strong state tradition, they have a very different relation to the land. Yeah? The land is like, a, it's, it's not territorial relation to the land, but more of a coastal because they tend to graze and they go on each other's territories to graze when there's rainfall. So you have a very different kind of society. And also the Islam, it uh, allows for a much more kind of loosely knit and disorganized religion yeah? than, than Christianity does. So you can actually read a lot of the historic conflicts between Ethiopia and, and uh, Somalis to just focus on these two as like the typical state versus nomads conflict. For example, in the 16th century, the Somalis, uh, not uh, sorry, the Muslims, uh, a Muslim prince based in Harar, which is more or less here, which is let's say on the edge of the highlands, um, with, all, with uh, almost exclusively Somali troops, he invaded the Ethiopian highlands, the Christian highlands of Ethiopia. The Christian highlands of Ethiopia at that time, the Portuguese had just appeared, uh, so in the 16th century, had appeared uh, in this area. And so they appealed to the Portuguese emperor to help uh, come and save uh, their fellow Christians. But the Portuguese uh, came, it took them too long to come and didn't maybe take it very seriously. Anyways, so the, the whole Ethiopian, the Christian Ethiopian um, Empire, which had lasted for about 2,500 years by then, yeah, since about 1,000 before Christ, uh, from the Solomonic times, it was first Jewish, by the way, uh, until, uh, until uh, 1500, but um, it was destroyed by the Somalis, and then also the whole region fell into decline. We have something similar as in Afghanistan, where I don't know if you remember, but we saw that in Afghanistan, we saw the, um, how through ancient times, all the caravan routes passed through Afghanistan. But when the seafaring routes opened, then those land routes, they declined. And suddenly, like a place like Afghanistan, that like, kind of falls into oblivion. And something similar happened to Somalia because uh, this all throughout, let's say, the um, ancient times and all throughout until the, 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 our Middle Ages, until the 15th, 16th century. Somalia was quite prosperous. There were quite a lot of uh, important towns along the uh, sea, sea coast. They've already been described by Greek sailors and by, I, no, first they were described by Egyptian sailors in already 1500 BC. So we're talking about a long history. And then when the Portuguese came and they disrupted the Arab Indian Ocean trade and, uh, and opened a new route going straight from Cape Good Hope into India, you know, like going the long, then suddenly this whole kind of 
uh, Indian Ocean coast coastal trade, it went into decline. And so the same happened here, yeah, from from the and affected Ethiopia too. So let's say from the 16th century to the 19th century it was like a really downtime for this whole region, yeah, until the colonial invaders came. So now I want to introduce you to something which is apparently which is used a lot uh, since the 1970s in Africa. Uh, I think the first to come up with this idea was uh, Leopold Senghor from Senegal, who said, you know, we Africans, we actually have a triple heritage, cultural heritage. One is our own African animist heritage, uh, the community, the clan, the place, place of worship, the spirits of their ancestors. The second heritage is the Islamic heritage that we've been in touch with since at least the 16th century and like in, in uh, some areas much longer. And the third heritage is the modern Western heritage, yeah, which came with colonialism, yeah, the, the modern way of doing things. And the Somalis, they have like, uh, according to uh, one author that wrote this book in between three civilizations with interesting subtitle, Archaeology of Social Amnesia and the Triple Heritage of Somalis. So he brings in this concept, uh, the, the author is a political scientist, but he's also a psychologist and he treats psychological disorders among Somalis in Hargeisa, which is the capital of Somaliland. And he finds that in his investigations, he often finds that, that Somalis have repressed identities and under the layer of like re, uh, Western uh, kind of rationalism, uh, Western worldview and the Islamic kind of uh, uh, worldview and the belief uh, the ethics. Under that still lies, he says, a kind of a completely suppressed pre-Islamic Somali identity of, um, and, and it's interesting to see how the Somalis completely disregard their own history. Yeah, It's apparent, probably because it's a very kind of difficult subject psychologically, but apparently because they just have no interest in history, they're just much in the present. Yeah? But the, as this professor Bulhan says, who founded the uh, Franz Fanon University, you know, the Franz Fanon author, yeah? So he calls his own university, Franz Fanon University in Hargeisa. He says that Somalis actually suffer a collective uh, inferiority complex, which makes them extremely sensitive to external critique. That is something I've learned to deal with and anybody working with Somalia will have to learn to deal with that. That they're extremely sensitive, yeah? So just a few pictures quickly to put you in the mood. Uh, the old pictures I took when traveling through Somalia and Somaliland. This is Somaliland. Here we're approaching a site with these rock paintings. And these are uh, said to be four to five thousand years old, which means two to three thousand BC. It's worth to notice that already in, in, the, in the third millennium BC, around 2250 before Christ, uh, the, the Egyptians they recorded their, their, um, their trade with Somalia. No? So it wasn't like, uh, it's not a place without history as we sometimes tend to think about or tend to talk about Africa, but it's really interesting to see also like compared to other rock paintings, how stylized these are, yeah? You can see like a dog, Again, it was a kind of a discovery because everybody thought dogs had come much later. And, but they're extremely stylized with very small heads. And you'll see that all the people are going in the same way, which kind of, I would say, like indicates a level of culture. Because when you try to draw something, it's something else. And when you actually have established a code for how you draw, let's say, a human being. Here you see also, this is, uh, you wouldn't maybe say right like this, but this is a beef, yeah? Uh, like, a, sorry, a cow. And they show, uh, they, they portray almost all their cows in a similar way, yeah? It's a very big, wide, white neck and like horns on his head. And the giraffes, which also show that obviously the climate was very different many uh, thousands of years ago. Yes, Malavika? Um, I just want to know that despite being um, that close to Egypt, 
we see that though there are a few similarities, there isn't a lot of similarity between the way uh, humans and animals are portrayed in uh, hieroglyphics and in uh, Egyptian paintings versus this. So um, is it safe to assume that they were not really that connected or influenced? No, they were not influenced because, I mean, obviously they could have like had some Egyptian uh, painters and scholars come on those trading expeditions and teach them how to make drawings. But obviously that didn't happen. They had their own, uh, their own style and their own tradition. So, uh, yes, I mean, it's, by the way, it's not that close to Ethiopia, to Egypt either. Yeah? I mean, if you would like to go to Egypt, you still have quite a like, few mountains and deserts to cross. But uh, Egyptians, they went there by sea, yeah? They had like the, so the place where the Nile comes closest to the Red Sea, they had like, which now has these beach resorts of Hurghada. There they had a port and they would like set out from the ports down the Eritrean Sea, as they called it at that time, the Red Sea, and, uh, and, and do their trade along that route. So here again, more pictures all of the same site. It's quite amazing how well preserved it is. But you see that it's actually quite, it's actually very artistic. And then that was like, so that was like heritage number one, yeah, the pre-Islamic heritage. Obviously I could say so much more about it, yeah, but by now let's go uh, in terms of uh, Islamic heritage. So it's interesting to know that uh, this is the most crucial thing for the Somalis. The Somalis, they all, uh, the one thing that, that really surprises foreigners about Somalis is that just about every Somali will be able to recount all his ancestors all the way back to the uh, original ancestor of all the Somalis, which according to legend came from Saudi Arabia, and which was one of the companions of the Prophet. So the Somalis they have created this history of themselves, which is completely contradicted by archeology span and by uh, that, their history, which is very much based on this Islamic concept of Jahiliya, yeah? that, that the whole world was in ignorance before the light of Islam shone on it. So that they say that we, this, pop, this country was hardly populated. There were a few kind of animistic tribesmen underdeveloped. And then the Arabs came, uh, the, the companions of the prophet came with all their glory and uh, established by uh, intermarrying with the local girls, they established the Somali race. That is, and, and then each Somali makes it like really true for himself by being able to recount all the ancestors, the whole genealogical line all the way up to the top, yeah? And that's what they call up here, so. So anyways, this just shows like how deeply also, like from a, let's say that psychological perspective, how completely buried this whole pre-Islamic identity and past is, yeah? So if you come, like I found some ancient statues in Somalia and I was like really interested. Yeah? I was so like eager because I thought, you know, this can like rewrite the whole, I didn't find them myself. They were presented to me, they were shown to me, but I recognized them for, for what they were. I had, the expertise, at least online. And, um, but the Somalis had no interest in it, yeah? They had no, the Department of Archaeology, no interest. Yeah? Anything pre-Islamic? No, we rather not know it exists. And then I found out that a lot of pre-Islamic heritage has been discovered, yeah? Like Christian tombstones, Sabayan, which is from the ancient uh, Yemeni kingdoms, uh, Sabayan inscriptions, uh, Jewish uh, stars of David, everything so was mixed there, yeah, but everything is just like kind of ignored because the only thing they want is to have their own sense of history uh, validated. So here, this is the, um, the palace of the Sultan of Zanzibar. So most of Somalia was for a long time under the influence of the Sultan of Zanzibar, while the northern coast was more under the influence of the Ottomans, yeah, or the Egyptians who often stood in for the Ottomans. Yeah, here you see a, the old town of Berwara, which is clearly still has a kind of Ottoman feel to it. It's obviously quite dilapidated, but... And then the, the final layer, obviously the western layer, so that came in two waves for the... two simultaneous waves for the Somalis. One was from Italy, and the other was from, the, from Great Britain. I'm just checking the time and see that so much time is going fast. So I have to go a bit faster. But to speak shortly about the colonial period, the gist of it, yeah? So first of all, Somalia was not interesting for, for the colonial powers until the Suez Canal opened. And when the Suez Canal opened, suddenly like there was this scramble for the last part of Africa, uh, which was the Horn of Africa. 
So Italy, France, Great Britain, all try to, to grab their part of it, and Ethiopia also. So we know Italy got Eritrea and then Somalia, they bought it basically from the Sultan of Zanzibar. Then uh, the British, they took the northern coast of Somaliland because they were mostly concerned uh, with like the shipping lanes uh, and piracy already at that time. And they also wanted to, they had like Aden, the port of Aden in southern Yemen became like the ma main kind of, one of the main focal points of the whole British Empire after the opening of the Suez Canal. So they wanted like have a steady meat supply for Aden, so that's why they colonized Somaliland. They didn't colonize it, they just had a presence there and became a kind of a trusteeship. But this is also what explains the later splitting of Somalia and Somaliland, because those two had been originally different colonies and they were brought together only in 1960 with independence. So while the British, so while the British didn't invest anything uh, in Somaliland, just about nothing really, um, the only thing they did is like keep minimal order. And once in a while when a ship ship uh, shipwreck had happened off the Somaliland coast, they would like send in troops to make sure that the ship was not looted. But Italians, like in their style, they you know you have to give them one thing the Italians that they had like this grand colonial style. Yeah. So wherever they went in like a very short time, they would build many beautiful public buildings, they would build roads, ports, railways everything yeah, in, 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 in a very short time. So here you have the Cathedral of Mogadishu, which obviously lies in ruins and nobody will repair it. And then on the English side, the, oops, sorry. The, one author called Somaliland the Cinderella of the British Empire because it was really getting nothing at all. But the, one of the main chapters in the history of British Somaliland was the fight against what the, who the English calls the Mad Mullah and who the Somalis call Saeed Mohammed Abdullah Hassan. Uh, so here you have like uh, the statue of Saeed Mohammed and the British. Yeah? The British actually used some of their, they pioneered some of their warfare techniques, you know, they in, in Somaliland. Notably, they did, I think, the very first RAF bombing So this is like very shortly about, uh, maybe I should just say one more thing. So about the colonial period, you know, in some African countries, the colonial period was extremely brutal yeah? and uh, with a lot of bloodshed. Yeah? So obviously we know about DRC Congo, we know about Namibia, uh, we might know also about Kenya and uh, how the British, like they suppressed the Mau Mau revolt there. We know about Sudan, the Mahdi revolt, uh, but in Somalia, to like we have the war here, but the, honestly, the war it wasn't. It was one of those kind of wars of movement, we could call it. Yeah. So there were no mass murders uh, committed by the British at any one point, and usually they were just like arming uh, Somali tribes to fight against the, the clans that were allied with the uh, Madmula. Same in the Italians didn't really commit any kind of atrocities. Yeah. So there's some sense when you go to Somalia and Somalia, you don't hear much about the colonial period. Yeah, there's not so much, it, it doesn't weigh very heavily on the conscience of the people. Like I, I lived in Kenya also, and in Kenya it's extremely present. Yeah, this whole kind of, this colonial mindset basically. Yeah, like the white man, you know, what the white man means in Kenya, which is, you know, which doesn't have any kind of, it's not at all the same in Somalia, there's no, Kind of massive inferiority complex, there's no grudge, there's no hatred. In fact, the Somalis in general have taken a lot of the habits of the Italians, like eating pasta and, uh, and having coffee uh, late night outside in the streets. And, uh, and they kind of, strangely enough, they look quite favorably. Oh yeah, one thing that they liked about the Italians was that the Italians decided to conquer Ethiopia. So the arch enemy of the Somalis the, was conquered by, and was conquered effectively by Italy from 19, 1936. And obviously the Somalis uh, they provided a lot of troops. So that was something they actually had in common yeah, with the Italians, with the fascists. 
And the fascists, obviously, they had like their very kind of racist laws, but they weren't, if you look at it really closely, they were hardly more racist than the similar, similar laws of the British and the French at the same time. So it wasn't that they were so much more racist. It was, uh, and the fascists had this kind of idea of like, if you just pump enough energy and money into uh, a colony, it will emerge. So they did actually start enormous irrigation projects and uh, like very massive schemes, but they didn't manage to finish any of them because of many different reasons, but also because they lost the war against the Brits and the British, they, by 1941, they had captured Somalia. And until 1960, Somalia was under a kind of a trust, uh, UN trust fund, which was strangely enough managed by the Italians, the former power. Although the Italians had been defeated in the war, they still got this trusteeship to prepare Somalia for independence until 1960. So I'm gonna, the basic social structure, I think the one thing that you really want to know, uh, need to understand, is that the community is more important than the individual in Somalia. So you don't like, if, if somebody from your clan um, kills somebody else, then you also are responsible. You're gonna to have to pay for it, yeah? On the other hand, if you commit a crime, then your whole clan is going to uh, take the responsibility, shoulder the responsibility with you for it, yeah? So it has a kind of a very strange effect. And uh, you can understand it, it, like in terms of thinking of one man, one vote systems, it doesn't really necessarily make sense, huh? Is everybody still with me? No more, no, no other questions? Yeah? Okay, I'm just going to like skip through this in a little bit. It, it is interesting, but um, I already mentioned some of it. Another thing to know about the clan system in Somalia is that you have um, clans have, of different nature. Yeah? You have really big clans, yeah? the powerful clans. Yeah? And that's not historically fixed. Yeah? I mean, it can emerge. Clans also merge, you know, like small clans they merge together, big clans they split. They start rivaling with each other after, after a few generations, nobody even like remembers that they were, I mean, they will remember that they have a common ancestor because of this capacity to trace your gene genealogy back to the original ancestor. But they will like be, you can be at political loggerheads. Yeah? So there's nothing kind of fixed and determined in the clan system. Right? It's, it's a fluid, basically a fluid concept. But you do have a, a few things that the pastoralists, they are more important than the agricultural clans. So like uh, anything sedentary is viewed on, as like with a bit of like, um, Mepri with a bit of a, um, uh, sorry, um, how do you say that? Uh, um, well, you know, they, 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 you rather be a pastoralist and uh, with your, with your grazing with your flocks than being a sedentary farmer that is working the land. And then also uh, within Somalia, you have many smaller communities, which are called the minorities which have, which are kind of grouped into clans, but they don't really have clan structures. And these are like a lot of the original inhabitants of Somalia. So the, the pre-Somali, the Bantus, you have like a lot of the slaves because the Somalis in the slave trade, they were slave buyers. Yeah? They were not, they didn't, there were no Somali slaves in the rest of the world, but they bought slaves from the rest of Africa to work in their plantations. And the Italians continued to practice. Yeah, And they got like uh, even, Parliament, the Italian Parliament in 1905 got really angry when they found out that the Italians, although the slave trade had been completely banished by, by then, the Italians were still buying slaves to, uh, to work in, their, uh, in Somalia because no, they couldn't find any Somalis to work in the, in the fields or in the farms. Yeah? Okay, so, uh, and, the, and the one very other important thing too, which is really confusing for foreigners, is that Somalis never mention the clan. They never talk about clan. You'll look any publication, anything online, like any Wikipedia page, any uh, anything made by Somalis, and you know they have so many different media outlets online, they will never mention the clan of a person. Well, it's so important for them, yeah. So it's really strange, but they, they have this kind of it's kind of a taboo subject for them, yeah. It's kind of a repressed. Uh, so when you're talking with people, always they're talking about clan. They'll say, oh yeah, they, they'll explain everything through clan. Yeah, they'll say that this person has this political view because obviously he's of that clan. So he's with that person. 
who has a similar political view, or they're doing business together. So everything is explained through clan, but you never say it. You never like publish it. Yeah, you never say it in an official discourse. Uh, that's something really kind of quite strange about uh, about Somalis. And they don't actually have like they. I think they probably it can be explained by a feeling among Somalis that clan is a bit shameful. Yeah, they should be modern. Don't they have this triple heritage already? The Islam doesn't it frowns on the clan identity, and I uh, want to focus obviously only on the Umma, yeah, the, the the community of believers, and the, um, and the Western are obviously even more. You know, they 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 they, 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 they think clan is kind of ridiculous and backward. So that probably explains why the Somalis are, are very hesitant to mention their clan. But, and also they have made policies uh, in, in to kind of, to, to make clan disappear from public life. But with the whole collapse of the state and with all the war and all the hardship, the clan has always remained and again affirmed its, its, its importance as the basic social safety net of each individual, individual. So you won't find any Somali homeless people you don't even find them in the West, yeah? because there's always some money from your clan and that person has to help and will help. Yeah? And so, um, so that is something, it has like all these good and bad sides. Yeah? Here you see some, these are like the, these are like Bantu Somalis, yeah? They have like different features and they have, they live along the rivers. Anyways, let's go on. So let me just check the time. Okay, I'll just go quickly through this one, yeah? Here's a map showing the areas of influence. This is a map I used to make when I was working in my previous job. So you notice I was working for NGOs. Um, I was providing security information for the whole NGO sector, yeah? So each NGO working in Somalia was automatically almost kind of registered with us and would get our updates are and our daily updates and our um, analysis pieces and maps etc so here the pink area it's area controlled by somaliland the border officially is here but puntland effectively controls uh part of uh, eastern somaliland because the clans living there belong to the same kind of clan family as uh, those in puntland then this in yellow, it's all Puntland. Yeah, Puntland is an autonomous state, but it's part of federal Somalia. So it recognizes the, that Mogadishu is the capital and it recognizes the government, the federal government of Somalia. However, it only recognizes it when it wants to. So whenever it wants to, it, like, it prints its own money, Puntland. It has its own foreign policy and, and many other things that, that the federal government very strongly objects to, but Puntland being quite strong and being quite peaceful, uh, goes its own way whenever it wants to and whenever it does think it, uh, but, but officially it's still part of the federal government of Somalia. And then here, everything in light green, this is all the areas controlled by Al-Shabaab. Now you'll see that even where they don't, they, that almost all areas here are either light green or they're shaded, light green plus something else, yeah? So in fact, Al-Shabaab has control over uh, almost half of Somalia, I know, here, we'd say, and it's more than half of the population because this is much more desert and dry. And here you have the big rivers, the Shabela River and the Juba River. So along these rivers uh, is where most of the population lives and in, in, in the coastal cities. So Al-Shabaab like, has, it's very difficult, uh, but it probably controls about, let's say between 30 and 50 percent of the territory. And all the different colors here, it's because the federal, the federal government has split into, into member states and each member state has its own armed forces. Yeah? Puntland, Kalmudug, Irshabele, Southwest State and Jubaland. Oops, sorry. So Somaliland became independent because after a very bloody war with the federal government of Somalia, that was the Siad Bari regime. Siad Bari was a dictator who, who uh, from 1969 all the way to 1990, was the president of, of um, Somalia. He led the country to war against Ethiopia in 1977, 1978. 
And then he, afterwards, he led the country into war with itself. And um, so the northwest of Somalia, which now is Somaliland, was uh, so almost what they called a genocide, the, the um, local population. It maybe wasn't a genocide, but were lots of mass killings. So, talking, so we're first talking about Somaliland, yeah? So, I'll really try to keep it really short, yeah? So what's really distinguished, distinctive about Somaliland? Somaliland is a really unique case in the world. What's really interesting about Somaliland is that it actually created a state, a functioning state, without any international support. So it didn't get either financial support or political support. The UN actively destabilized Somaliland in the early years, trying to, trying to kind of make the local government, uh, which had brought peace in, in fall, in order to reintegrate it into Somalia. Um, then, and then no regional power supported it either. Yeah? So really, they, they did it by themselves. And it was very much based on all these local clan self-governance structures. So they had like these endless conferences, which would last for uh, many, many months, yeah, up to half a year, where they would sit together, all the clan leaders, and anybody, any adult male could come in and join any time and leave again. Uh, and they sat and they discussed and they discussed until they agreed on a form of government. Uh, so it's actually, in a way, you could say it's extremely democratic, yeah? And by 2001, after 10 years, that process had kind of uh, been completed. In 2001, the constitution was adopted. And from that point on, Somaliland actually started becoming integrated into the uh, regional and, 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 and international uh, community. It started getting de facto support from the EU, notably, and also a lot of other European countries. So actually, since uh, in the past 20 years, it has been more and more actually recognized as a state. And the funny thing is that like this whole like kind of pure democratic beginning has been very much corrupted since 2001. Uh, notably, like with well, this diff different factors, but one factor definitely is international aid. So international aid comes into the country, goes through the government, even though the government is not recognized, actually it does go through its ministries, and they use it to consolidate their elite power. Yeah? So, and then a multi-party system was uh, brought to Somaliland uh, with an electoral system, which is increasingly dysfunctional, yeah? as it's being more and more kind of dominated by money and uh, oligarchic groups. Here are some pictures of Hargeisa, the capital of Somaliland. These are the three main political parties. This, these are uh, young women at an electoral rally and a poster. This is that with uh, and this is just a, I'll just go through this quickly because it's interesting, but it's a bit long. Here you see like a contemporary cultural center. So uh, they have a very conservative idea of Islam in the sense you won't find any alcohol or anything in the whole country, but they do have like their own traditional dancing and singing and uh, it's not only for men. And this is like the contemporary new business now yeah, with a lot of investments from, from Emirates, but they're not investments by Emiratis, by, but investments by Somali businessmen based in the Emirates. Now here we're like quickly moving to Mogadishu. This is one of the places I used to go uh, to eat, the pizza house. This is a place I, I, I enjoyed a lot. It's kind of a cafe boat in the harbor of, uh, or near the beach. In the background, you see the beach, the Lido beach of uh, Mogadishu. This is what like the more well-off areas of the city look like nowadays. Sports fields and obviously uh, AstroTurf and a lot of these kind of buildings. It's quite a green city. This is a discussion night at one of the um, think tanks where you like the very Somali style. You have the professor Badio, who is one of my main informants for my PhD. And he's discussing with all these young people, like uh, they have like topic subjects. So it's nice to sit there. 
Now here is, oh yeah, I didn't even ask you, but did you actually read? Let me just see. Let me just stop showing you a moment. We actually read the um, Delight Bargains text. I mean, don't be, I wouldn't be surprised if you haven't, but who has actually read it? I just read the executive summary. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I understand. I mean, you have to read so much stuff for your for your for your work. Away. By the way, have we all? I'm just checking who's still there. We okay. Okay, you couldn't read everything. Well, obviously, yeah. Okay, so yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, well, then it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I'm not going to like dwell on it now. Yeah, because we don't have much time. Um, I think Malavika, you wanted to know about Malavika left, no? Because you wanted to know about the perceptions. Okay. So let me then just go back to my slideshow. So I thought it was an interesting text, but I'm not going to go into it now yet. It will require a bit more time. But it's a very interesting kind of analysis of how the rentier states of how a rentier state like that of Somalia, a rentier state dependent on international aid actually works. Eh? So if you want, I can share, if you're interested, I can share the presentation later. So while I was in Somalia, in Mogadishu, I uh, experienced this attack, one of these complex attacks eh, of the Al-Shabaab. A complex attack, it's like an attack where, where they use different ways to attack a target. Typically, they first blast through the outer defense with a bomb car. And then once that outer defense has been breached, they, a second squad comes in with guns and starts shooting off the place. Yeah? And uh, I didn't take that big description myself, by the way, I wasn't allowed so close. But um, I did go back the next day, and this was what was left of that hotel, along one of the main thoroughfares of uh, Mogadishu. But what's really surprising is, and that's what um, the Somalis also talk about it a lot themselves, is the resilience with which they just like, the next day already after the attack, they start clearing up. In a few uh, weeks, they start building a new thing, and then, uh, and they'll build an even bigger, and nicer, more beautiful place instead of uh, the one that has been taken down. Yeah, I don't know. This is something that's important to know. So, like the Somalis, like they spend about half of their uh, half of all the foreign currency is spent on a drug, yeah, which is called cat, and which doesn't grow in Somalia, it grows in Yemen, it grows in highlands, yeah, and Somalia doesn't have any highlands, so it grows in the highlands of, of uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Yemen, but not in Somalia, but they eat low, big quantities of it, like a bunch like this goes for three dollars usually, or if it's high quality to six, seven, eight dollars, up to ten dollars, and they'll eat two bunches of that a day, so you really don't understand anything about that economy. Like the per capita GDP is like $500 a month. And you know, the salaries they actually make can be like three, $400 a month. And somehow they find the money to spend on chewing this much cat. Now, is anybody interested in, in understanding the whole kind of piracy story? It's a bit old, yeah. yeah? Yeah, I would be. I'm okay, you too, Rubab? Okay, I can't see all of you, but I guess, oh yeah, Miranda, okay, good. Fine, so to understand piracy, like one element is, as I said, is the overfishing of the waters, which means that so many fishers, who obviously didn't, didn't get any investments and were still fishing in the old way, suddenly they couldn't get any fish anymore, yeah? So they, that was number one, getting upset about that. Second is, of course, they knew about the toxic waste being dumped uh, in the coasts. So they were angry at, the, let's say, the world for doing that. And then came uh, 
then came that there has been always a concern about piracy. There has always been a low level of piracy. And uh, this has led uh, the UK uh, especially to invest in anti-piracy uh, groups. And what happened like in the early 2000s is that there were some investments by, uh, especially by Heart Secure, by you know, the UK security company, private security company. They trained Somalis, uh, they gave them new boats, new guns, to uh, conduct counter piracy operations, but at that time there were only a few piracy operations per year. And then they left and then the program stopped, yeah, and the funding stopped. And those people, they uh, having been trained, having have, have got new boats and new weapons, they decided to, uh, since the funding had dropped, they decided to become pirates instead. And obviously there's no better training for being a pirate than having had counter piracy training. <laughs> so that's also one of the origins. Then there's a third origin, which is like, um, which is this business aspect of it. So there has been this kind of perception that piracy thrived in Somalia because it was a lawless state. Yeah, it was a stateless, there was no law and order. But the interesting thing is that almost all the piracy happened in Puntland. And why Puntland? Because Puntland actually is a functioning state. Because to be a pirate and to run a piracy business, you have to have actually functioning banks, functioning wire transfers, functioning logistics, uh, airports that you can take off from. Uh, so like you can't, like, and this happens, uh, it's a bit the same story that sometimes you've heard about uh, terrorists, but you need like some basic level of infrastructure to run a proper criminal organization. So that's one other aspect to it. Then Puntland was like unhappy with the status quo for a while, yeah? Why? Because they had, um, they, like they had gotten the, um, they, they, had, they had joined the federal state of Somalia. But anyways, politically they were unhappy. Yeah? Let's not go into the reasons why exactly now. And then you can see like, for example, the next to Puntland is Somaliland. So Somaliland is uh, actually much closer to the shipping lanes that go through the Gulf of Aden. And it has a functioning state also. But in Somaliland, there were, after two piracy attempts, there was no piracy anymore. And the international community usually said it shows that they have a strong state and a kick-ass police, yeah, and security services. But that's not correct, yeah? They didn't actually, the reason they didn't have piracy is simply because they didn't want to have piracy. So when the first groups went out and like started uh, kidnapping the boat, then the elders of that clan would go to the people who had kidnapped it and said, you immediately release that boat or it will kill you all, yeah? And, uh, and this is, both basically with reputation. In Puntland, they didn't have that incentive. Yeah, the elders, they were like, okay, fine. If you can like, like since the world is like not paying attention to us because we don't get funding because uh, fine, yeah, you do it. So there was a kind of a situation where piracy was kind of accepted by Puntland authorities. There's a very funny movie called Pirates of Somalia, which is the movie, which is, uh, the movie actually is based on uh, an author and his book, which is called The Pirates of Somalia. Uh, and it traces his story and how he wrote his book. Um, it's really interesting because it shows, among other things, it shows like how the how piracy was so much accepted in Puntland by the authorities and suddenly a new government comes into power in 2013 and or 2012 or 2013. And they uh, have changed their mind and they want to root out piracy yeah, to get international respectability and they do. So there's a whole aspect of piracy, which was very much, piracy basically started on land, yeah? And it started on land and the main factors to understand why there were pirates are not military security factors of, uh, it doesn't have to do with logistics or anything. It really has to do with the politics and the culture behind it. Another thing about the, what I found when I was traveling myself to Puntland, because I would see big palaces and like built, these kind of cream colored palaces. And then I would ask, uh, oh, wow, who lives in there? And they would say, nobody. I'd say, what, why not nobody? Well, we hope to rent it out to an international NGO or the UN or something. But why is nobody living there now? Oh, it was built with pirate money and pirate money is haram. So they have even like culturally, they have this idea that like the money that the pirates were getting, those millions that they were getting and that they were building these palaces with, was actually haram money, yeah? you better not touch it. If you touched it, you were like, you were tainted by it, yeah? So there's uh, so even in a sense, like they didn't really manage to do so much with the money. 
So here you see, uh, this is not with Barry Vaud, yeah? and this is not with Barry either, it's just a friend of mine who pretended to be Barry just so I could take a picture. Now, Al-Shabaab, yeah, the third state. So, honestly, a lot of what you've learned about the Taliban can be applied to Al-Shabaab also. Basically, it's a nationalist insurgency. Basically, the main goal is to uh, be able to um, self-rule according to their conception of Sharia. Like the Taliban, their main target is uh, double, it's both the foreign forces, which in the case of uh, Somalia, it's this AMISOM intervention force, which consists of troops from Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Burundi, which are all four Christian countries, yeah, not very smart, and Djibouti, yeah, which is only, uh, which is the, not Christian. Anyway, they want to get rid of the AMISOM, they want to get rid of all those Turk, uh, sorry, British yeah, and Turkish and uh, American trainers that are training the uh, and sending drones, operating drones, and of the puppet government, yeah, what they call the puppet government. Like the Taliban also, it's very unclear. I mean, uh, so like the, they have focused in uh, improving the governance, yeah, and especially in the field of justice. So there's so, so many similarities, despite the vast cultural dif differences, that it's really puzzling, yeah? And of course, often you're not supposed to like dwell too much on similarities because people will say, ah, oh, no, but then you're like pretending that everything is the same, Afghanistan, Somalia, no. Obviously I'm not the kind of person to pretend it's the same, but I'm really struck by those similarities. So yeah, they focus on governance and on justice and uh, fiscal and law and order. And uh, also, uh, they have the same lack of legitimacy and social acceptance as the Taliban. Yeah? So basically, the Somalis would rather not have the Shabab, and they're against it. But they're kind of, since they are so strong and hard, and will they accept them? Yeah? That's that's basically how far it goes. And similar to the Taliban, they were not beaten by all the successive waves of multinational troops, drone warfare, etc. So honestly, I'm starting to think that drone warfare, you know, it's like, this, it's something from a video game. Yeah? It doesn't work in real life. I mean, for it doesn't work in the sense that you can kill people with it, but you can't break an insurgency. And like the Taliban also, the link to Al-Qaeda seems to be mostly rhetorical, yeah? Uh, you know, Al-Qaeda doesn't have a really big central bank to fund them with anyway. And the, even the media empire, like uh, Al Qaeda, is pretty weak and everything. So, so Al Qaeda doesn't really have much to offer except the kind of a uh, affiliation name, which the Taliban also use. So you see a really grainy picture of one of their Sharia courts. So I found out to my surprise that, like, even in Mogadishu, like the. Um, even like for, for st stupid business disputes or domestic disputes even, the, if people have a dispute and they can't like solve it themselves, which means among their communities, the elders, then they will actually travel outside of Mogadishu uh, to go to one of the uh, Al-Shabaab Sharia courts uh, because they, the one thing that nobody wants is the government justice, yeah, the federal justice system, because it's super corrupt, it's super slow, and it's super inefficient, and there's no implementation. Well, all those things are fine on the, in the Ashabab courts. Yeah? It's fast, it's predictable, and there's implementation. So they have a very deep penetration of Somali society. Like when I go to Mogadishu, I, I don't like, you know, I don't want to be in the protected zone of the airport. Yeah, I don't want to be locked where all the other foreigners are. So I like have my friends, uh, my Somali friends reach out to Al-Shabaab and I basically check with them uh, if they're okay with my coming, yeah? So one time I went there and I was giving guest lectures and I was also doing my own research. And another time I was working on a coastal research program. And both, in both cases, I just like basically ask their permission first, yeah? And when I get back from my friends uh, through at least two different channels, I, I don't trust one channel, that uh, it's okay, that they couldn't care less about me, then, uh, then I'm fine. Because I know that not only, uh, that I know that you know, I've warned them, which is kind of like the correct thing to do. You know, they, they know I'm there, they know, and I'm not going to be like a target for them. 
but that's how deeply they've penetrated. Every single business in most Somali towns, which are officially run by the government, pays taxes in Mogadishu. Not, uh, no, Mogadishu, I think it's every single business also. In some places, not all businesses, but almost all of them pay taxes, which is like a protection racket, yeah? Which if you don't pay the tax, you're not getting anything back for the tax. The only thing you're getting back for the tax is no attacks. <laughs> If you don't pay the tax, then you might find your a grenade thrown in through your shop window. And this is the other side, you know, the Al-Shabaab, they also have their own humanitarian effort. So they, um, so they mostly, you know, when the drought strikes, they, in the territories that they govern. And they put a lot of like media, they're very savvy in the media. They have like extremely well produced videos, except that they can't show them anywhere except on some Russian sites. But um, but they have this kind of pretty savvy operation to kind of hearts and minds, not for the Somalis because they don't really care about so much about it, but for the diaspora and the international community. Now, finally, this is where I'm going to stop uh, at this point. After this, it's, it's just look at um, it's interesting to look at the international narratives about Somalia because you know narratives they explain so much more than they should explain. Yeah, they explain a lot of like the handling, the conduct of of uh, international organizations, of private people. So in Somalia, I guess you could probably maybe. You already have one here, which is what I call the Savage Somalia uh, narrative, which is very much the narrative of the entertainment industry, yeah? the media, no? like the movies about Somalis, and also like the less scrupulous media. So basically here we have Somalia as this kind of bloodthirsty, crazy, fundamentalist, pirate slash terrorist who wants to kind of kill white people most of all. And then there's this idea that, yeah, you know, that's because Somalis, you know, they're based in clans and they're not, they have like all the, all the bad things they have, they're Muslims and they're black and everything. So, you know, definitely they are like the most kind of like incapable of changing people, yeah? This oriented stroke. Now I want you to like suggest what you think is the is second and third narratives. Come on, have a go at it. Anybody? Oh, there's only uh, six people left. <laughs> well, that's all right, I understand. No, no, sorry, I'm wrong. It's just my, my screen is not good. Caius, you have any idea? Um, I'm really not sure, sorry. I mean, like we can see the one here, so like an emerging market, right? Ah, the one? The, like as an emerging market. Yeah, that's one, exactly. So that one we could call the rising Africa narrative. Oops, I got them both, sorry. Africa rising narrative. Yeah. And here, the Africa rising narrative, it's exactly the one that all the international agencies are giving now, yeah? And it's very much against the first one. So this is this kind of idea of like, okay, the whole Africa is going through this amazing progress. The GDP is like double digit growth or well, even single digit is good enough. And, uh, you know, we have like this amazing telecoms uh, revolution and it's so savvy and like there's, this is like a, the Africa rising narrative. Yeah, but the funny thing is that, you know, although obviously it seems very favorable uh, towards um, Africans, it's something that Africans rarely have themselves. Yeah? It's very much, again, an imposed narrative. Yeah? And obviously it's in reaction to this kind of always this doom and gloom narrative of like Africa, oh my God, you know, Africa, it's this mess, it's not going to get better. But um, again, it's a little bit, um, it's a narrative, yeah? So it's delusional mostly, yeah? And you see it very much in all the reports of the EU, of the OECD, like all the big international organizations, they'll always like portray in every successive report like that this country, it's like doing so well. And it will, it's delusional in the sense that they don't actually recognize all the enormous 
conflicts and problems and issues that the country starts to deal with. Yeah, the only ones that they will easily recognize are like things like environmental issues. Yeah, like desert locusts. Even Al Shabaab usually is not mentioned in reports. Yeah, so usually it's like uh, if it comes to Al Shabaab, oh yes, there are still some there are still some terrorists uh, and they're creating the spoilers and they're creating, but it's. Basically, it's something that the government is dealing with and we're dealing with and it's almost finished and it's almost over. Yeah? And they've been saying that for many years and it's exactly what we heard all the time also about the Taliban in Afghanistan. For so many years, we heard the Taliban, oh come on, we don't need to speak about them anymore. They're done for, they're almost finished, yeah? And so you hear the same thing again in Somalia, although you saw on the map like how much penetration you have. And then the third narrative, it's, a bit maybe somewhere in between the other two it's this narrative of the the poor somalis yeah the victimhood yeah which is very much the humanitarian and the ngo and a bit also the left-wing media uh narrative yeah and the less, less philosophical post-colonialist narrative yeah of like uh, you know they're still under this kind of imperial uh unfair Treatment, yeah? Now, obviously, in each narrative, it's not that the narratives are wrong completely. Each narrative has something right, yeah? And it's also, I mean, the first one may be less of all, but still even the first one also. But, uh, so yeah, as I put it here, it contains elements of truth. But the important thing is that it really mostly serves its own constituency. So the entertainment industry and the media, which feed this kind of savage Somali thing, it's because it sells well, yeah? And the EU and the UN who are took, and the uh, African Development Bank and so which I keep telling about you know, is Africa rising, it served them well because it shows that their involvement and the fact that they've been spending so many billions of dollars in this place uh, is paying off, you know, that's good. Well, obviously the NGOs and have an interest with the whole kind of poor Somali narrative because it makes people open their purse yeah, and send money to the agencies. So none of these three narratives as such has much benefit to Somalis, yeah? Uh, and that's something I remember uh, talking with like UN people about. They really believed that the Africa Rising narrative was good for Somalis, yeah? that it gave them pride and it gave them a good place. And I said, no, it gives you pride in a good place, not, not other people, not the people you're talking about. And one thing that I, that's really bad is like this engagement with ground realities. It's, completely absent, yeah? Whereas, you know, there's like a, and I'm gonna to come to this now, but there's basically very little understanding or exposure basically of all these international agencies to the ground realities. For example, NGOs, NGOs, they work almost entirely remotely for security reasons. I mean, security reasons mostly, but also for reasons of kind of uh, this ideology of uh, capacity building. Yeah? So instead of sending white people to do the work, you pay uh, local people to do the work. Yeah? And that has like security advantages and it has also the obvious advantage of allowing uh, the uh, skills transfer and uh, capacity building yeah? and creating local organizations that work. Now, that really sounds very nice, yeah? Um, and, and I mean, it's definitely a very good intention, but strangely enough, it doesn't really work like that, yeah? So what you actually see is that the, the NGOs run by Somalis, local NGOs, they tend not to actually have much impact on the ground at all. And mostly they, the people working there use this position to increase their own status, uh, to buy better cars, bigger cars, to have nicer offices with more plush furniture, to have um, bigger offices in nicer areas of the town. And then they use the money to kind of start uh, politics usually, yeah? Get engaged in politics. And funnily enough, they're not very much on the modern Western side, as you might expect, but most of them are actually more attracted to Islamist politics. So this is the net result of a lot of the humanitarian aid is like some aid going to local support, uh, to, to support local, the people who need it. And a lot of it actually going into uh, the NGO itself. 
And the fact is that nobody will go and control. And if they do send like some monitoring team, then because of security reasons, they have no access. And so my position, for example, there was like very different because I would actually go to places. But uh, I found that I was often the only one who was doing that kind of underground investigation. And of course, the NGOs didn't like that much. And nobody liked it, yeah? Also the NGO and headquarters they don't like it, yeah? Because they're happy with everything just functioning apparently fine, you know, smoothly. So we're talking, talking about NGOs, but honestly, the UN is in a way much, much worse, yeah? So here you have, this is one of those big refugee uh, settlements, which tend to, once they are built, they tend to last forever and ever and ever and ever, yeah? Tens, de decades, 20 years, 30 years, even now in Somalia. And there's just no really, there's no, it doesn't seem to be really any solution to it, yeah? So the big, then also all these NGOs, they keep going, they are, they are very much donor driven, more and more, yeah? Like the NGO used to be much more independent. It used to like collect its money and then set up its own program. Now donors, Western donors in particular, they want to micromanage, yeah? They want to know exactly like, okay, how much of the money we're giving to you is going to support gender programs? How much is going within the gender program to programs against gender-based violence? How much is going to the vulnerable refugees and the minorities? And how much is going to counter violence extremist propaganda or like how they call it training? And so all that stuff is more and more like the, the donors have the political objectives and they want to make sure and, and they seem to be neutral political objectives and they want to make sure that NGOs um, do that. So now the big thing is resilience. So the Somalis have, you know, they have like the drought after drought and sometimes they're hit by a flood for a change yeah, instead of a drought. And that has been like basically Somali life for centuries, yeah. And they have they know how to deal with it, of course, under population pressure and under uh, more and more kind of complex external pressures. Things do get more complex. And basically, they still manage to deal with it. Nevertheless, the world sets up resilience programs, yeah, to help them. And basically, instead of like making another well, they will teach the Somalis how to work with the wells that they have, yeah. And they call this resilience, which is really ridiculous, yeah? Because to have like foreigners come to teach Somalis how to be resilient, it's really a case of learning versus how to fly. And also there's something really important about how the food aid destroys agricultural markets. Yeah? And that is something which is being all the time ignored and again, you know, not acknowledged by uh, Western donors. I really picked a fight with the WFP on that one, yeah, with the World Food Program, because they 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 were so ignorant for it, yeah, they they were so willfully ignorant that every time that they bring food aid, they like depress local agricultural prices. It's very simple, actually. It's one of the things that Al Shabaab also has kind of critiqued uh, the international aid industry with. They say if you need to help Somalis like resist drought. And why don't you buy our local farm produce first? Yeah, you buy our local farm produce at nice prices. So it means that the farmers get well paid, which means they have money to, to invest in uh, expanding their farms. And you have, you buy local produce, which is also much healthier and much easier to transport and uh, it's much fresher, etc. So it makes so complete sense that it's really painful that the only people that are saying this are like the terrorists. Yeah? So you think, okay, couldn't we actually kind of adopt and understand that discourse and do something about it? Yeah, knowing that actually, I mean, also I don't want to support the Al Shabaab figure, I know the Somalis don't support them. Yeah? Like I can say here that they have some good ideas and everything, yeah, but it doesn't mean that when I'm out there in Somalia, I can actually be seen to, to do anything like that would be in support of them. Yeah? Um, because, you know, it's a political position I don't even want to take. Yeah? But anyway, so but that, that didn't go through at all. Yeah? The WFP basically, there's some really strong pressure because they get so much from the funding from the same Western countries which are dumping their, ex, their exodus, their, their agricultural exodus. And so all this money, this humanitarian aid flowing into Somalia, for example, who determines what a bag of wheat sent from the USA costs in terms of aid? Obviously it doesn't cost anything, it's given for free, but it's put 
on the books as like, hey, yeah, $25 or so. So, I mean, you know, there's like a, a lot of like, it's very unsavory business actually at the end. Yeah? The, the whole, this whole kind of humanitarian chain has like, although the intentions are very good and it's good to keep reminding ourselves of that and, and, and the idea to help other people is really important. And we, we shouldn't just lay back in cynicism and say, well, you know, I should, you know, there's no point in doing it. So something has to be done, but again, we have to be ready to change things. And in a way like Turkey and China are much more kind of open-minded about these kind of, um, these kind of humanitarian dilemmas. Yeah? And they do much more to kind of send the money right where it needs to go instead of just having it follow path which benefit many different parties, but not the final intend intended beneficiaries. Again, here's a picture of flooding, but you know, one of the things that hardly happens is roads being built, yeah? Now, now because of the Ethiopian highlands getting more and more rain and the uh, lowlands getting less and less rain, the, the problem of, of floods, flash floods is uh, increasing. So to do that, to, to deal with that, we need canals, yeah? irrigation canals. But those kind of things don't, they, it seems like impossible for, for the most of the international community to actually do something like build an irrigation canal. So they give the money to the local government and the local government puts it in the pocket. Or they use it like for the community to build maybe a school or something else, but they don't use it for irrigation. Here's a typical one of those projects. Uh, the sign on it says that it's, it's a bus terminal and it was built like years ago and it cost $250,000. So I went to look at it, but it was built completely on the wrong side of town, far away from any road, far away from the bus routes. And obviously it was built on somebody's private land and it had never once, according to the people around it, opened its doors to serve as a bus terminal. And now it's a $250,000 spent by the UN. And here is the Berbera Public Library. So obviously culture cannot receive any funding from the international community because it's never a priority because culture is like a luxury. So we need bus terminals, not, uh, but anyways, so this public library was built by the local community. So I went into some pains to find out who had financed it. And it turns out that basically they were big businessmen who uh, had like set up a committee and then they had like gathered money from many other people so that they could set up their own public library and a part of the library is supposed to be a museum. So it's kind of funny to see like these, I mean, these are two extreme cases of like where, you know, what, like of, of how development actually happens in practice. Uh, the drought. So I could say more about it, but I want to finish and I'm actually almost done now. Yes. So here you have, um, the first time I went to Mogadishu, I stayed in this hotel. Yes, it's a hotel. Uh, called the Peace Hotel. Yes, it's the Peace Hotel. And uh, <laughs> I'm just laughing because it really doesn't look like it, does it? And this one is, is like part of the airport complex of Halani, which is uh, kind of the green zone of Mogadishu. And I was there to actually be, become acquainted with the town. So I was like kind of insisting that if I was there to become acquainted, my, my employer had sent me there, that I had to be able to leave that hotel and to actually see the town. And so finally, because of my incessant nagging, they arranged with uh, uh, an armed escort for me. Uh, oh, here's Halani, sorry. They arranged an armed escort for me and that, that costs like $1,200 a day for me to go sightseeing in Mogadishu. And then the armed escort, they, the, the, so they had one Jeep with their armed people and they were driving in front. So they were driving at breakneck speed through the, through the streets of Mogadishu. And obviously I in the back, since I was in the back, I couldn't have them to stop. Yeah? I kept asking, can you call them on the walkie talkie and tell them I want to stop here. So anyways, that trip turned short. But later I, I returned and I managed to always stay outside of this secure zone and stay rather counting on the security of my Somali hosts and uh, knowing that Ashabab wasn't going to attack me. 
yeah, here's the green zone of Mogadishu. For those interested, you see it's built around the airport. Here you have uh, Amisom, you have the CIA, you have um, all the embassies, the major embassies, you have the UN, the UN compound. Here, so the EU compound is around here, the British embassy. So it's all around this, this one airport, yeah? So everybody can be evacuated really fast. And the people who are in there, they almost never leave, yeah? Out of pity, I took this picture of like an, a very friendly NGO worker, yeah, but she, but this is the typical life of an NGO. She was actually working in the hotel, in the Peace Hotel. She had her office there. So day and night, she's there behind her laptop, writing reports, doing assessments, collecting information, and she doesn't leave. She, I mean, she might leave once or twice a year to leave the hotel and to go make a lightning visit to a field project, but preferably not. And there's a life, yeah, no alcohol, no fun, no dancing, no uh, nothing, yeah. It's just this really dry life, yeah. And it's extremely saddening to see that that people originally with the idea of coming to help other people, you know, they're basically trapped into these kind of work situations. Okay, with that, I'm done. Sorry for, it did, obviously, I said it was going to be one hour, did I? <laughs> Sorry. So anyways, <laughs> really no time to talk, but I didn't, so thank you, Ruba. So anyways, do you have any questions or any comments or reflections? Great, unmute um, your mics. Uh, sorry, I just had a quick question. Can you, uh, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, sorry, this is just uh, in response to what you were saying before about the World Food Program and how it would it might be a better solution to actually source uh, from local um, sources instead of buying from international sources. And it sort of just uh, raised this question for me that I think we talked about in our Afghanistan seminar as well. But I was just wondering if you had any perspective in this situation of um, maybe what is the way to balance local and homegrown efforts of humanitarian aid with international intervention as well? Yeah, well, listen, I think honestly, like what I found now also with this World Food Program, when I, I went up to, I tried to take the discussion up to a high level using my own position. Yeah? And I just wanted to know why, was it true that it's really because of the lobby interests of the, basically the agro industrial sector in the USA and the EU and the influence they have on the government and the influence obviously those governments again transmit to the WFP. I couldn't really believe that they would be so kind of, but, but honestly at the end I, I, I did get signals, I didn't get a clear cut answer. But the signals I got were, yes, you know, don't touch it. Yeah, this is a core aspect of the business. So I really think that it needs kind of um, advocacy. Yeah, it needs like a campaign, basically. Yeah, it needs, we, because it makes such sense. Yeah, why don't you buy from local farmers? Encourage them to produce food. Instead of, now we're discouraging them. Because which farm is going to produce food if, like, so much food is dumped free of charge in the area that it lives in, yeah? So... The way to balance it simply is really we have to kind of find a way to rein in those big food juggernauts, yeah, the, especially the, the World Food Program. But it's quite hard because so many interests are involved in it, yeah. So, well, anyways, but it's something that not, must be done. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions or comments or reflections or thoughts or whatever? Um, I have a very general question. Um, do you think um, the the situation is like can be solved by more of a political approach or economic approach? So, like, which one is more fundamentally like um, direct when we want to um, solve the this this uh, like entanglement of interests? Yeah. Well, you know, the funny thing about uh, economic, uh, uh, economics is that it happens anyway, yeah? whether politics are there or not. So in a way, let's say it's a, the default background noise, it's uh, the economy. 
So, for example, it's been very surprising for a lot of analysts to see how the Somali uh, gross domestic product has clearly been rising, although it's not pretty easy to count it, but it's very obviously kind of growing uh, throughout all the years of statelessness. Yeah, so let's say from the mid, from the after the main part of the civil war, which actually already finished by 1993. After that, uh, the without any state, without any rule of law, without any investment, without any international banking system, etc. There has been a steady growth in, in GDP and just in the economy, basically. Yeah? So, uh, so if you don't do politics, then the economy is basically kind of organizing itself. Yeah? And uh, so whether the, the problem should be solved politically or economically, I think that rather than bad politics, it's better to have no politics. Because then at least kind of the self-governance mechanism and its economic kind of networks and structures kick in. So, but obviously it would be preferable to have good politics. So, but, but when, you know, like this, it, we need to unra unravel a lot of the current interests in institutions which are involved in these kind of politics before we can actually, I think, get to good politics. And honestly, like when I think like that, there's a change on the horizon with like new actors, uh, new global actors starting to become more powerful. I think maybe there's a good chance now to kind of also to 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 kind of change some of those ingrained kind of bad habits of uh, of the Western dominated international intervention industry. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Mathieu? Yes. yes or Leah, please, go ahead. I also like a quick question more on justice because you've uh, talked about um, Al Shabab uh, courts and the Sharia laws, and, and it was really similar to the, um, the Taliban and the, um, in the Afghan case. I, I thought like the, the fact that uh, the federal government and the, the federal law was uh, seen as corrupted and not the, the most efficient one. And I was wondering if, because there are like the there there is both like this lack of resources that to to access the system, and also the the people have like um, more practical view of the of the justice. Is the is this view something problematic on other fields than just uh, justice? Is this like on the political or economical side? That is it. This lack of understanding of how they perceive it differently or is it more um, that that prevent like to really implement something that could be efficient to as a, as a, I, I mean at, at the state level or can we solve this problem or should we solve it after all yeah well I think well first of all the last question should we solve it and obviously they have to solve it yeah but um, but yes there are like if you look at the political system yeah like the election system then again we have like the same kind of mismatch between the traditional systems, uh, the traditional systems, the kind of the Islamic influence and the kind of the Western imperative now. Yeah? Those are again, I keep coming back to those three different layers yeah? because I think, and again in Afghanistan, we had the same three. Yeah? We had the Sharia law, we had the customary law and we had like the Western formal system, uh, rule of law system. So yeah, it, it's not only uh, in the justice sector, you can see it in um, in, in clearly, I would say also in the political sector. Uh, I don't know if also in others, but it makes these kind of differences between what, how things are expected to function and how people are used to make them function. Uh, that that big gap is very problematic in both cases to justice and politics. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else have any question? So I hope it has given you like the desire to get to know this place one, once. There's a lot of people, places that it would be very nice to go to maybe in 20 or 30 years when it's peaceful. <laughs> Afghanistan definitely is one of those. But the Horn of Africa is really interesting also. And I haven't even talked about it, but like in the, because I also lived in, in, in Kenya. So if you like take those three bordering countries of Kenya, Somalia and Ethiopia, you're basically, there are three different universes, yeah? You're three different, completely different cultures, different histories, different daily practices. 
So like against this whole idea of like Africa as a country, like this absolute kind of marvelous diversity and, and which makes it really interesting to travel, obviously. Okay, well, my time is up again. So thank you for having been here. It's funny that Vidar didn't join. He was, uh, went through all this trouble to set it up. I hope he maybe he just forgot. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have tried to be in touch with him. But anyways, good. So I look forward to reading your papers. Yeah, thank you, Miranda. Take care also. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a nice evening. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Okay.